for joining us today. Um, thank you to Money 2.0 getting us together. Uh, we're going to talk about insurance, so usually it's when the room clears. Um, <laughs> but I will tell you that we'll keep it brief and we'll keep it uh, to something that actually relates to all of us. So to my right, we have Jim Fasone from Alexis Networks. And we have uh, Doug Alizi, uh, Easy from uh, Largo Financial, and I'm Alex from Navigator Risk. Let's see if this is going to move. I don't think so. There we go. So this is this is Doug's firm. Doug, you want to talk about? Yeah. So we we financial service firm. We do long-term care, life insurance, asset protection, and um, employee benefits. Just basically ways to keep businesses in, in business and do what, what they're meant to do, and also forget about making too much in the sense of losing employees when the right time for them to keep the employees in place. So. Uh, Navigator Risk, we do high risk uh, risk management practices for businesses in the construction industry, real estate, financial, uh, crypto, nonprofits, just really managing the risks and the factors that drive insurance costs is really where we focus outside of the insurance transaction itself. Um, we do a lot of our work is very data driven, which is where the technology comes into play. And um, that's where Jim's company's uh, skills kind of come to play. Yeah, so Alexis Networks is an organization that provides predictive insights um, and technology solutions really for almost any business problem, particularly in financial services and healthcare. So the applicability we'll talk about a little bit relative to insurance and risk mitigation, risk selection, and risk management. Well, I'm going to kick this off then. So, uh, you know, believe it or not, um, if you're in the technology space or you're a vendor or purchaser of technology out there, uh, global IT spending is going to exceed $4.4 trillion um, this year alone. Um, so you look at that compared to GDPs out there, I mean, you've got four or five major countries that the spend for IT is greater than the GDP of a number of these nations out there. It's just absolutely um, astounding. I read a stat in a, a presentation I gave a few weeks ago in Denver that 90% of all the data that's out there right now is really created in the last three years. And I'm talking about social media and then the advent of COVID and the impact of, of remote work and all the data that's been uh, transferring around the world. Um, it continues to increase at a phenomenal rate. So that spend rate is nearly 40% higher than just five years ago. So clearly there's a, a trend and a movement towards investing in technology of all types, but really, really why is that? Um, so you look at um, some of this information, and I'm not gonna go through all the pieces here and, and kill you with the slides, but the amount of data um, in zettabytes, which I couldn't even tell you what that is exactly, but it's a lot, I think it's a lot. So it's growing uh, significantly out there right now. Um, there's so much information being shared, which creates an opportunity um, for data transfer and technology actually increase value of companies and increase efficiencies, clinical outcomes, um, et cetera. But there's also a significant amount of risk associated with that. And along with this investment in technology and this, this desire and this drive to looking for solutions, business solutions out there to various problems, um, there's obviously billions of dollars pouring into the market um, to try to invest in startups and technology companies to solve many of these problems. So what are some of the technology and emerging risks out there? Um, it's actually exploding. Um, data is growing in value. So historically, data was something that um, was done on paper. You collect it in files. You put it in a file room. You had somebody go get you a file, bring it to your desk. You'd look at it. Now there's more data on your phone than there was 10 years ago at, at most organizations. So the, the true interesting part of this, and we talked about it actually at this panel last year, um, was that data itself soon will be, in my opinion, will be a balance sheet item, right, for most companies. There's going to be a future value associated with data extraction and how it can benefit that organization. Now, how, how the auditors and regulators figure out how to value that's going to be an interesting, uh, interesting story. But I truly believe that data um, is growing in value and companies are going to start wanting to monetize that. Uh, data also, yeah, go back here, sorry. Back to the other one. So data has inherent risk, right? So as the increase in the value of the data is seen, 
there's more risk in that data because it has value. That's why we see much, so much um, hacking going on, so much ransomware, so much social engineering, because there's, there's value in that data. So like any other asset that has a growing amount of value, organizations and individuals are going to want to figure out how to steal that. Right, and transfer that. Um, two thirds of all the ransomware attacks occur in the healthcare industry. Why is that? Because personal information has a ton of value in the black market. There's all kinds of regulatory issues out there that organizations have to comply with. HIPAA, there's this new patch act that came out. The reality is that as much and as many things an organization can do to protect that data, um, there's Millions of people out there that are sitting every day, 24/7, trying to figure a way to break into that and and you know try to hack it and transfer it. Um, so risk has to be mitigated, right? So how do you mitigate that risk, and how does technology support that? And to that, I'll I'll speak a little bit about how infusing a, a firm like Alexis and and kind of their work. You know, we do a lot of work in the nuts and bowl space, right? You know, we put boots on the ground and we, t we, f we solve challenges in everyday businesses. You know, everything from, you know, construction companies to transportation companies and real estate companies. And the first thing that happens is, I, you know, we, we start with, you know, where's the pain? You know, what's, what's the problem? Why are we having this meeting in the first place, right? If we're a fee-based consultant, we, only, we get hired to be fired. So if we're not actually uh, solving a problem, what value are we bringing, right? And so in, this, in the cyberspace, we're really looking at, Hey, did you have an event, right? Did something happen in that world? And then, all right, did, did it happen? Did you happen to buy insurance for it? Um, for a long time, uh, folks could get cyber policies pretty inexpensively, um, but they weren't really all that convinced that they were gonna be, you know, hacked or, or a part of that world. And a lot of times you find that type of religion the hard way. Um, you go through it and then you realize, well, maybe it could happen to me and maybe I should have bought that policy. But then for some people who actually had the policy, there wasn't coverage because they answered questions a certain way in their application and in that application they said that they had certain things or they did certain things that they didn't actually do. So now you had a scenario where you had an uncovered claim where you thought you had a policy. Uh, and then we look to did you actually put um, any systems and process in place to be able to prevent these things in the first place. And that's one of the things that the insurance carriers do. Insurance carriers will say, okay, we're going to give you a policy for X amount of dollars, but uh, you need to do these things, and you're going to test that you did them, and then if you didn't do them, that's a, that's a condition for us to deny a claim. Um, so it, it all comes back, to, it comes back to data. That's why we're, why we're talking here today. Um, you know, we all know we, we get to opt in on sharing our data in, in everything we do. I mean, even signing into the app here today at the, uh, at the, at the hotel, uh, you had to opt in to share your data. Um, so data is out there, and, 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 and to, to Jim's point, it's what you do with the data. Um, we track a lot of data for our clients in terms of we believe that claims come from prior non-claims, right? Near misses, we call them. Um, something, an almost happened, and that you have a couple almosts, it usually tells you where your next claim is going to come from. I usually use the, in New York anyway, they use this driver's point system, um, you know, for the New York State DMV. You know, as you get uh, point, point, uh, um, violations, you know, on your license, and eventually you, they take your license away. They're not taking it away because they have nothing to do. They think you're going to become a hazard uh, to, to the public. And at the same point, um, it's usually an indicator that something's going wrong. You're not listening, you're a new driver, whatever it might be. So what you do with that data creates actionable items for you in your business, uh, actionable items for your clients, actionable items in your world. And, you know, I'm actually, you know, curious to see it. You know what I mean? We, we track series of data for our clients. And when you mesh adding additional series of information, you can actually find deeper, deeper items to forecast off of if you're using the right technology uh, to do that. And, and Jim's company, Tana, talks about that. Um, you know, the, the prior speaker, uh, actually two speakers ago, was speaking about um, outsourcing versus insourcing, uh, for those that didn't see that. But it's really a trend that, that I see kind of expanding. Um, you know, as a business owner, and many of us here are business owners, you know, we know that every time you, 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 know, you hire somebody, you hire them, um, you know, for the ability to influence them, for them to carry your message, 
Um, but at the same time, does it become efficient to have that person, right? The example used about in-house counsel or in-house CPA. Is that an efficient use of your resources? Or can you outsource for a fraction of the cost and get a lot more done? Um, you know, post-COVID, or I'm hoping post-COVID, you're seeing people live all over the country. You know, we talked about different areas of Utah where people wouldn't live. Different areas in, in, in Texas and Florida where people thought they needed to be near, you know, a major city. Um, High-end professionals want to want to be able to live where they want to live and be able to work where they want work from home and work remotely. Um, and so the outsourced, you think about the idea of you know the best surgeons in the world or the best attorneys in the world, they work for themselves. You know, you bring them in because you need them. You plug them in. You pay a you pay a, a premium for them for that project. You don't have them on your balance sheet every single week, every single month. And I think that outsourcing function. And all the technologies that we have around us really put us in position to be able to leverage that and get the most for, for our, collectively for, for our businesses. So I'm seeing that in the insurance space. We don't sell insurance. Uh, that's, that's what Doug does. Um, but we consult along the process to make sure the right products are being purchased and you can, you know, educating on where you can buy custom projects, uh, uh, policies, coverage. Uh, create your own insurance company. I mean, there's a lot of opportunities out there with the te different technologies. And so worrying less about who's in-house and, and getting it, you know, for a third the rate, you can get six professionals and a team. You know what I mean? So really embracing the outsource. Um, you know, in the in the workers' comp space, I'm seeing a lot in a lot of AI technologies that are work in, in coding, uh, coding of bills, uh, making sure the bill rates are, are, are appropriate. Uh, based on uh, prearranged bill schedules, and Bill can talk. To, I mean, Jim can talk a little bit about that in the in the healthcare space. Um, but again, you know, uh, in a lot of commercial businesses, if somebody gets hurt, um, essentially everybody just throws it to the workers' comp carrier, and they file the claim and they handle the claim. Um, but that alienates the employee. Um, and then if you talk about having a good culture and you want to take care of your, the people on your team, well, now go try and do that. How are you going to run your business and then also worry about which doctor they're going to for care or, or whether or not they, got, they went to the right doctor? Um, and workers' comp itself isn't going to do that. So having these outsourced nurse case managers really help uh, shepherd that process. Let me um, make a, if I can make just a quick comment on the, um, the outsourcing part of that. So it, the whole, the term professional nomad I love, right? And this is a post-COVID term where, as Alex is saying, that there's just been this opening up of the world for people to live. And there's countries, Malta, et cetera, that promote, you know, hey, work here, we'll give you a tax credit and all this good stuff. The, the fact people have been clamoring and fighting employers for decades to work from home. You know, what do I need to come in the office five days a week, 10 hours, fight traffic, and sit there at a desk and plug in and do the things I can do sitting at the house, taking care of the kids or, or whatever it might be. What's what's different? Well, COVID obviously forced the hand, right, to to let employers or enable employers to say, okay, employees, this is, this is our only option. We're being forced to do this. But it's technology that actually enabled these organizations to measure the productivity and make sure that, which is why economically um, we got through this because our, our country still functioned. I mean, we didn't buy as much stuff, and I think what's going to come out of that is people are going to realize they don't need as much stuff, right? But the reality, you have this, this, um, this final um, employee raising her hands, high-fiving, saying, told you so. Right? We told you we could do this. Now they're a little more enabled to even say, and not only am I going to do it, I'm going to continue to do it. Um, so that's a whole different discussion relative to where that goes, but it's productivity, and it's the measurement of productivity through data analytics that allows this to happen, allows the, con the companies to continue. So I don't know, Doug, if you got some thoughts there. <laughs> no, um, you know, when, you talk, when we're talking about hacking, and a lot of times most people don't realize how powerful insurance companies are when it comes to protecting data, especially when it comes to protecting your money. So one thing that we've been teaching is realizing that so many people are getting scammed when it comes to their banking institution, the savings account that they're putting their money in. So we're re-educating the American consumer, showing them how to now start leveraging cash value insurance to use that as their banking system to put their savings, their emergency money inside of those accounts so allow them, which also gives them a, another layer of protection where hackers cannot get through. So it's a lot easier for me to pick up your ATM card, pick up your debit card, and go into your banking system and, and upload all your money. 
but it's not easy for me to go into an insurance company and access all the cash that you have sitting in your savings account with the insurance company. Most people don't realize that insurance company, the U.S. insurance companies alone, they're, very, they're the largest in the world with so much assets than most banks. But because we've been told to put a lot of money with our traditional banking institution, most people don't see the value of using cash value insurance as a way to save money for emergencies. And so that's what we've been teaching a lot of folks, just re-educating, showing them how even banks, how they leverage cash value insurance as a way to pack their money. So It's also creditor protected, right? Yes, it's yeah. creditor protected, the IRS lien proof. The IRS can't tax you on the money in your insurance policy, for those of you that don't know that. <laughs> so, I mean, just... Just, you know, leveraging back, um, you know, through the use of these technologies, I mean, you can essentially start to see what your future could be um, and, and start to then dictate back to the insurance carriers. You know, the insurance carriers are, I always see the insurance world as a, as a zero-sum game. They always win, right? They always make money. They always make more than they spend. Um, and it's built that way not by accident because they're also very data-driven. You know, they're, they have underwriting guidelines that tell you how the how uh, an account or state a sector is going to perform they know right when something's going down right when they need to start adding more premium to a certain area in order to offset other areas uh, and if they're doing it why can't you do it right why can't your clients do it you can essentially go back and use that same data back to the insurance carriers and say well listen i can appreciate all that but here's my data and that's a much more proactive conversation going back to insurance carriers which is one that we promote and, and I know, Doug, you promote this, you know, that is, as you're collecting information about, about, you know, as Doug's collecting information about for his clients and we're doing for ours, you're going back and you're saying, you know, XYZ insurance carrier, uh, this is why this is a profitable transaction for you. You may not be interested in it, but let me share with you the rest of the, the rest of the story. And that actually, you know, can change their opinions. It also can empower, um, you know, your, your clients. Ultimately, uh, clients that, that start to have successes, they start they want to own their results, right? They want to be empowered in their own results. And in doing so, they want to own the process. Um, and as you can start to invest in yourself, you can literally start to create your own programs. You can start to create opportunities for yourself just, just through your data. Um, and I'll just share this slide real quick. You know, one of the things that we work with in the commercial space is uh, we're essentially getting our clients to report claims the second that they happen. Um, and we're doing, we're using obviously technology to do this. We're doing this for sports franchises and, and arenas around the country and, and Fortune 100 and 500 companies. And essentially, um, w when they report a claim, uh, even if it's not a claim, if it's an incident to us, the same claim reported 14 days after uh, it happens, the cost increases 18%. So two exact items, but separated by two weeks. Just by reporting it late, it goes up by 18%. And uh, 35 days, it's up to 45%. So just thinking about that, time contaminates situations. The quicker you can start tracking it, you are in a better position to be more nimble as a business, to be able to make better decisions about where to hire people, where to deploy resources, and I'll ultimately get the end result. Whatever it is the result that you're looking for, you know, data is going to drive you there. Um, and I'm going to move through this. Go ahead. Yeah, real, real quick comment, though. I mean, the, the technology component, it doesn't matter. It's not just an insurance function, right? So uh, mitigating risk should be the job of every organization, right, from the C-suite down. Because if you can mitigate risks, right, from a customer churn standpoint or from an inventory management standpoint or supply side standpoint or a, a turnover standpoint with employees, you're going to improve your operational efficiencies and margin, correct? So, so the insurance function, the transfer of risk that organizations have is, is kind of the last stop on what organizations should be doing every day. So technology cuts both ways, and as, as Alex was saying and Doug commented on, that, that insurance companies use technologies to you know, avoid risk, to improve risk selection, um, because again, their goal is to make a profit, right? So they can continue to insure. If they don't make a profit and they pull out of a particular line of coverage, like you know, homeowners in Florida, right, and in, in tier one territory after a cat storm, then all of a sudden the prices go up, just like we were talking about real estate a minute ago, right? Supply and demand. So the supply of, of insurance companies that are viable insuring risks 
means everybody else pays more for that risk transfer. But on the other side of the coin, if you're an organization, if you're a business leader, the better you use data to help show that you're a good risk, right? And I'm actually improving clinical outcomes if you're a healthcare organization. I'm actually you know, improving the things that make me a risk to an insurance company, whether it's mitigating risk for you know, property damage, fire, um, employment practices, liability, a general liability work comps a big one. Use that data to help not only understand your risk profile better, but use predictive tools that are starting to become available to identify those things and avoid them, right? So last comment I'll make relative to cyber is that the challenge with cyber liability, and I was involved on the brokerage side 20 years ago when the product first came out. Um, back then, nobody thought it would be a mainstream insurance policy. It was kind of a bolt-on to liability coverage. Most organizations are like, yeah, I hear about it. It may be an exposure, but at the end of the day, you know, why would we buy it? Well, now I would hazard a guess that, you know, 90-some percent of every organization, regardless of side, has some risk transfer associated with cyber. But when I talk to chief underwriting officers in insurance companies who insure cyber liability risk, they tell me they don't know how to underwrite it. There's no way to effectively price something that you don't have A, you know, 100 years of history, like in a lot of insurance coverages, and B, you really can't identify um, where the hack's gonna come from. Not to mention most organizations have no clue um, what they can do to prevent it. So that's why cyber liability and cyber insurance prices continue to skyrocket, because they're trying to stay ahead of these massive claims that keep pouring in. And whether you read the journal or whatever you read, every morning you're gonna see something where some data was taken, right? Whether it's ransomware or just, you know, you don't ever hear about what the ultimate settlement would be, whether it's insurable or not. And you know, I so think you were gonna talk about yeah. some of the tracking with the fleets, right? Yeah, we do. So we have a, like, a technology company um, that we use to track cars and, and fleets. And um, <clears throat> one thing that we've seen that's helped a lot of the insurance company when it comes to that, you know, tracking the driver's behavior, how you drive and all those things kind of helps you, you know, lower your rates when it comes to insurance. But one thing I wanted to kind of touch on real quick on the captive, especially since we have a lot of business owners out in here, you know, there's ways that you could actually, you know, minimize the amount that you're spending and still benefit from the, what you're paying out of pocket when it comes to insurance. Right, by becoming your own insurance company and self-insuring your company, you know, because you're paying out all this money for cybersecurity, you're paying money for your liability insurance and all that stuff, but you know you could become a captive insurance. Just to kind of help you understand a little bit, um, if you've ever been to Best Buy to buy a computer or a TV product or whatever, and they offer you insurance, that's Best Buy's insurance company. That's their product. So it's available to folks, but you just have to you know, tap in. I don't, if you wanted to add more to that, Alex. Yeah, I do a lot of work in that space. Um, you know, we're doing some uh, quite a bit of work in the crypto and uh, crypto mining space. And uh, you know, anytime you have insurance products that are hard to purchase or need customization, captive insurance can be a way to to go that route because you essentially creating your own company and your ability to insure it yourself. Um, business owners in those spaces have to make decisions every day about whether they're gonna self-insure it anyway. And by self-insurance, it means I'm not buying insurance and I'm paying the bill if it comes. Well, I mean, there's an IRS code that allows you to actually set up a company um, and allows you to actually uh, prepare and actually self-pay potential insurance claims with, ins with traditional insurance carriers behind you to kind of protect you against you know a catastrophic event and whatnot. Um, there's tax advantages, all kinds of things associated with it. But again, it goes back to usually the folks that ask me about captive are usually the folks that just pay a lot in insurance and they just want to pay less. And I usually start from the beginning, which is why would you want to change, trade places with an insurance company? What gives you the confidence, right? Insurance companies are zero-sum game. They make all the money. Why would you want to be them? What data do you have? What are you using? What tells you you're going to be a successful, you know, successful captive? So, you know, we bring that technology to our clients. You know, if you want to be in that space and you want to self-insure, far be it from me to say it's inappropriate. Let's go get the data and figure out what it says. Um, and you know, one of one of Doug's programs is is on the fleet side and and the fleet technology. Some of the stuff that we see on TV with, you know, telematics and geofencing, and you know, we know where people are watching their behaviors. But that tells you where your next auto claim is going to come from. You know, if you have a fleet. 
you know, why does uh, Progressive or some of these other companies have those little plug-in devices that go into your cars? Because they know that if you're not speeding, you're less likely to be in an accident. Uh, so they're going to incentivize you that way. So kind of circling the wagons here on really technology and, and how, that, how that really plays into the insurance world and managing risk. Um, you know, data is always going to be king, but you need to know what you want to track and why you want to track it and what you're going to do with it. Um, and, and by tracking additional data, it makes you eligible for, you know, special insurance programs, extra discounts, captive and self-insurance. I talked about it earlier. Why would you be comfortable if you didn't have the data to support it? And then obviously there's tax advantages that go along with it. Um, so I think we're going to get into the last part of, of, of your presentation. Yeah, just to add a little comment on that, it's, it's not just, um, it's really important to understand your data, right? Um, to do something with it, share it with organizations that are going to help you, especially when it comes to risk transfer or setting up a self-insured vehicle like a captive. But at the top of that list is that, you know, you need to be aware, you need to protect that data, right? So protecting that data is paramount. Um, and one example is a good example is healthcare, and a lot of issues around clinical outcomes and malpractice cases and, and near misses. If that information is out in public, you know what's the likelihood of you going to that facility again or going to that particular surgeon again, right? So the protection of that data is important from a PHI HIPAA standpoint, but organizations, especially in healthcare, what they need to do with the data is actually learn from it. Right, so you know, near misses in a surgical suite are learning opportunities to say, okay, we avoided a bad outcome, but let's let's gather the team around and look at the data on what we did when we nicked a bowel or what have you. Right, so now let's use that as an educational tool. And from a risk management standpoint, you know, having been in a lot of rooms with you know large reinsurers looking at hospital risks, your ability through data to show here's our trend and identifying. Um, information that we can share on near misses, and it's actually had a direct effect in reducing the frequency and severity of our claims. That's where technology can empower you to showcase that you are a better risk than others, especially when prices are going up overall. Um, so just jump into this slide real quick. Um, you know, the reality is as business leaders out there, um, you don't have time to wait, right? You can't wait months or years to get a solution. And a lot of the technology solutions that are out there right now are focused on one very specific problem, right? It's like there's, you know, there's six chairs at this table up front. You know, our business problem is I want that to have 10 chairs, okay? So Doug and his team and Alex and his team and all these other technology vendors come together and say, okay, you know, we're going to write a program, right? We're really smart and we're going to figure out a way to write a program to add four chairs to that table. Is that what you want, Byron? Yeah, that's exactly what I want. Okay, so great. So, you know, three to five million dollars and 18 to 24 months later, lo and behold, that chair now has, or that table has 10 chairs. That's great. Well, gee, thanks. That was expensive and it took a lot of time. And what happens in the meantime? Well, the world changes, right? All of a sudden, I don't have 10 people sitting at that table anymore. I only have seven. But I've already paid and committed to solve for, I need four more chairs, right? So what happens then, that company says, okay, well, that went a great experience, but you did what I asked. You know, I've got two monitors up on stage here. I really need to add a third. And it sounds like you'd be able to do a similar thing. Well, of course. So where technology's heading is that there's core technology that actually can solve problems regardless of what the data is, right? What the type of data is. And it's fairly rare, um, but it's out there and it's evolving. Um, because right now the process to go through it to negotiate and to deal with a dozen different vendors for a dozen different business problems, it's, it's a fool's errand right now. There's no return on that. And that's why it's so difficult if you're out there looking for technology solutions. There's so much white noise around oh, AI and predictive insights and intelligence and all this and machine learning and neural networks and all this sounds great and it's mostly marketing material because a lot of the money that's spent out there is to get buyers' attention. And I'm telling you, we've had a number of organizations come directly to us and seek us out because they say, you know, we've spent two years and $3 million, and there's nothing predictive about the result. It's basically a benchmarking. And don't tell me it's predictive if you're saying that, you know, compared to these other companies we look at that are like kind quality, you're a little better, a little worse. There's nothing predictive in that. I'm talking about true predictive like telematics where you can give the fleet manager or the insurance company and say, we can predict 
where and when accidents are going to have and, and with what driver before it happens. We can predict what patients are going to stop taking their medication. You know, we can predict what risks before you take them are going to be bad bets for an insurance company. We can predict from a mortgage lending standpoint which loans are going to default based on data and the predictive insights that technology now could pull from that. So if you look at just kind of the trend, and Salesforce is a really good example of where things are evolving into, you know, everybody's got a phone, and what do you have on your phone, right? You've got a bunch of apps. I probably have 100 apps, and I use 10 of them. I think three of them are stupid games, right? Just kill the time on a plane. But the reality is that we're in a society where we want solutions, you know, at speed of business, so to speak, right? So business leaders are starting to seek out solutions that aren't going to take months and years to solve one problem. You know, I want something that can be part of my operating system that when we come in and turn the lights on on Monday, I run a program and I'm able to see what's going on in bed business, regardless of location, regardless of country. That's the immediacy that business leaders are seeking. And it's this whole race to digital, and that's why the slide started with $4.4 trillion in spend for this year for IT. Why? Because business leaders are demanding. We have to get better. We're competing everywhere for that. So Salesforce is a good example that really evolved from the kind of the first CRM going from spreadsheet that folks like us use to track, you know, who we're trying to do business with and where we're at in the process um, to actually a, a whole app exchange, a marketplace of different types of solutions. So that's where, you know, on a, from, a, from a big picture standpoint, uh, technology solutions are, are heading. Go ahead, let's hit the next one here. So we've talked about this a little bit, but if you can mitigate risk, right, and improve your operating performance, um, why wouldn't you invest in technology to do that? If you can get there faster, and I would argue a lot less expensively, right? If you're spending a half million dollars or a million dollars a year for a license, and that's going to take you 150 bodies to throw at it for three years to get to the same, the same spot, let those let those let the personnel you know be involved with more customer success, customer acquisition, risk avoidance, risk mitigation, right? Let the data do what the data can do with the right technology. So it's it's growing far at far greater pace than the ability to manage risk, right? So that the zigabytes and terabytes of data we're talking about earlier, I don't care how many people you put in a room, you know, you can't get to it. You can't look and analyze a hundred million rows of whatever that might be, patient information or inventory information, let alone, right, across the columns, which are the factors that influence the patients, right, comorbidities, you know, demographics, right, you know, meds are on, et cetera, et cetera. You can't look at that, you, us, we, we can't look at that and determine any insights, let alone predict things out of it. You have to embrace technology to do this. So you've got advanced, you've got advanced machine learning to mitigate risk. Um, the thing about supply and demand we talked about, this is fascinating too. So the big tech companies um, are out there buying data scientists and data engineers, right? Signing bonus, paying them 20 or 30% more market. They're basically buying up the supply um, of either experienced personnel in that field, in the engineering field, uh, coding field, or that are coming right out of school. Um, we're working a lot with NYU and Rutgers um, interns and Princeton interns just because they're still hungry, right? It's like, to me, it's like, it's like college sports. They're still hungry. They're on the field because they want to be on the field, not because they're paid a lot of money. Um, and it's a way to capture them and capture their interest in an organization that's doing great things out there. But the point is that if you're thinking about a DIY um, program to solve some business problem, you know, good luck trying to find somebody to come in, let alone help organize what you're trying to accomplish and get them to sit long enough and figure it out before they aren't poached by somebody else for a lot more money. Um, so the whole, you know, in-source versus outsource for technology solutions is becoming harder and harder every day, week, month because of the costs associated with it. Um, you know, there's too many options out there for technology buyers to find those solutions. What, so what you really have to do, and Gartner is a big research organization, had a really good um, piece on kind of the decision tree for organizations looking for technology solutions. And the biggest hurdle is just sometimes agreeing on what we're trying to accomplish, right? 
And I equate it sometimes to uh, my mom, bless her soul, when she'd send me out in the backyard, you know, to clean the yard, right? And she'd say, oh, that, you know, the weeds in the back corner are really bad. Okay, so I go back there and I clean out those weeds. And I come back in all sweaty two hours later. And she says, well, that's great. Well, you know, now over there, that didn't look that bad, but now that looks bad, right? So you never stop, right? So the first thing you have to do as a team is determine what's, what's the biggest, biggest challenge or biggest business challenge or problem we have right now. And if we, can, if we have technology and data to support solving that big problem, why not start there? Because you're going to spend the same time, amount, effort, and money and personnel to solve a small problem anyway. But sometimes you may want to say, okay, let's, let's, do a, let's do a use case. Let's do a proof of concept. Let's pick something that's simple where we can show results because everybody knows you got to swim upstream to sell leadership on something anyway. Um, so again, business leaders must really identify, invest in these solutions, and they better do it now um, because we talked about competition. Everybody wants to compete. Um, every organization has stakeholders. Every organization has to perform, and if they don't, somebody else is going to figure it out. It's just like this race towards the great, the great resignation, right? So employees are now demanding that they work remotely. And some employers are saying, that's fine, but understand that if I can hire, you know, somebody over here working in Malta and somebody here in San Francisco and somebody here in, you know, St. Louis, Missouri, um, I'm going to migrate to the best talent also. So I think this is going to come full circle because a lot of high-salaried employees that are doing a certain function remotely, now you've opened up the world to compete for that job, right? Literally. Um, so that's what I've got on that particular piece. And I think this is kind of where we would kind of start to switch it back to a Q&A session. Um, I don't know if there was anything Doug wanted to add. No, no, I'm good. I'm good for Okay. Now. So if we had any questions, we'd be, we'd be happy to take them for our last couple minutes. Who's out there that's actually seeking technology solutions right now? Who, who realizes that in 2022, you better do something with technology to improve your business outcomes or you're going to be, so there's a couple, three hands, four hands. Um, so I would assume the other ones are either already in that process or have already done it, or maybe you're just starting the process. But um, if you're not doing it, I can guarantee you every one of your competitors is, and I don't care what business you're in. And when they do that, they're going to prove what? They're going to prove everything about their organization because technology is going to allow them to see things about their business that they've never seen before. And the hard part sometimes is you're going to reveal things you didn't want to know because what do you have to do when you reveal them? You have to actually do something about them. Um, so that's the good and bad about technology. So who's, got, who's got a question out just, just to add to that, too, because um, one of our companies that we have, uh, it's a technology company, and we track fleets. So we had a client that actually got into an accident in Cameroon, and um, he, he owns a tractor trailer. So one of his drivers got into a major car accident. And, of course, the first thing the, the cops do is they blame the, the business because that's the big money. Because we had our technology installed in, his, in the truck, we were able to replay the accident and found the driver was doing the speed limit. It wasn't his fault. It was the person that ran into him, which was a, a regular consumer that ran into the car, I mean, to the truck. And that saved, I mean, the driver was so excited that he had, and the you know the funny thing? The owner of the company wasn't even paying for our technology. <laughs> he didn't pay for that subscription. So it was, but we were collecting data anyway, you know, but after that, I mean, the driver, just thinking about a person with family coming back to say, man, thank you so much, because if not for your company, I could have lost my job. So technology is very, very important, and you know, I, can't, I can't stress that enough. Good point. Your thoughts, questions, comments? All right. Count one. Oh, Thanks, gentlemen. A really insightful presentation, and to know how um, data can assist in risk mitigation. Now, a question is: um, We seem to ensure all the material objects that are around us, businesses, vehicles, um, to an extent, um, you know, uh, home and contents. But what we see is this great resistance in probably ensuring your own life, and what 
the, the problem we've seen in, uh, in that area of space is the premiums are so high when you want to do anything that's life insurance and probably the process as well because the insurance company wants um, the insured party to be medically, uh, to do all the medical examination and the whole process that could be so long and um, drawn out. How do you think having the, the data that allows into personal insight to probably mitigate that risk, let's say if someone's a healthy person who you know, doesn't smoke, doesn't drink, goes to gym uh, five times a week, for them to go to these insurance companies and say, hey, or to probably an insurance broker to say, this is my physical attributes, this is how I live my life, so should my premium be a lot more simpler or cheaper compared to someone who is not doing the same thing? Yeah, What's your thoughts on that, how data can help? Yeah, I could answer that. So, actually, it's so funny you said that, because now we have one of the companies we use, we could do up to $3 million of coverage with no medical exam, no blood, no urine, just a lifestyle underwriting. So, to your point, we actually give coverages and give them a better rating, even if somebody has some small health issue, but because of their lifestyle, their credit rating, their, the, the activities they do, they could get covered without having to go to a doctor's office, getting a blood test drawn and all that stuff. So this is available now. In the past, you still have to go do the regular things you're talking about, but now it's different. So there's companies that actually are getting, are tapping into the new technology and just, especially when COVID also happened, so many people don't want people coming to their homes, you know, for medical exams. So it's made it so easier for, you know, for my organization and my team to be able to offer products and offer coverages to a healthy person that is doing the right things, eating the right food and, you know, taking care of themselves. Because I say this, your health is your credit when it comes to life insurance. No, and that's a, actually is a really great observation because technology should enable not just you know the companies that take the risk, but those that are seeking you know insurance or risk transfer, right? So, from an administrative standpoint, um, it it should it should ultimately make the process a lot easier for everybody. But as Doug's saying, you know, technology now allows you to look differently at risk, right? So, so one of our phrases is, you know, the data doesn't lie good, bad, or indifferent, it's gonna show you what's true, whether you wanna see it or not, right? So if you remove human bias, right, out of the underwriting process and out of a lot of other decision-making process and true, rel truly rely on results, right, and, and performance, and then predictability of that, that you're gonna get the best benefit whether you're a whether you're a buyer or you know or a risk transfer insurance company, now you may not like that, right? I may not have the healthy lifestyle that that Doug wants to underwrite, um, but at the same time, there's probably going to be other companies that will take that risk. But it's also a form of accountability. Whether you're a business, right, and you have high frequency claims and work comp claims, you don't do anything about it. You're going to pay for that, right? I always used to say for self-insured companies, you're going to pay for your claims one way or another, right? Whether it's you pay. The insurance company take the risk or you pay it out of pocket. You're going you're gonna to pay for it one way or another. Same thing, if, you, if the data speaks the truth about who you are as an individual or an organization and it's not that pretty, it's up to you to do something about it. It's not up to Doug's company to figure out a way to make it work for you, right? All right. I think that's it. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank Appreciate you. it.